Well, good morning, everyone. Um, to those of you who don't know me, my name is Douglas Park. I am an apprentice here at the church working here. And it is my joy to be able to uh, welcome you to today's service. So it's been a very cold start to the morning as we drove in. There was frost covering the parking lot. But well done to all of you for coming out on this cold day to come and, and join with us and join with the Lord in worshiping him. Um, we're going to start off our, our service this morning with this reading from Psalm 86. And it says, Among the gods there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. And that is who we are coming to worship today the only one who truly is God, and we are going to try and bring glory to his name. Please will you stand as we sing our first hymn together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please grab a seat. Well, one of the things that we do at this church is we say a prayer of confession. And it is not something that I just say from the front. It is something that we as a congregation like to say together. And it is a way of coming before each other and coming before God to admit that actually we haven't lived up to his standards, that even though we might be saved, we still fall, fall far short of where we ought to be as God's children, and we still need his saving grace every day. So please can I invite you to say this with me together. Father, we rebelled against you, and you were angry with us, but you did not destroy us. Instead, you gave your son, Jesus, to die in our place. You pursued us and led us to faith in him. You justified us and declared us righteous in your sight. You gave us eternal life. You adopted us as your children. You gave us a new nature, writing your law in our hearts and minds. Yet despite your abundant grace, 
we still sin. We do things we should not do. We do not do the things that we ought to do. Our thoughts are often impure, and we do not love you as fully as we ought. Because you have promised, and for the sake of your name, please forgive us. Cast all our sins from your sight, as far as east is from west. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask Andy to come forward and to just bring us some of the news items coming up. Thank you. Well, good morning, friends. It's actually amazing to see full faces. I, uh, does anyone want to come and see from the front? <laughs> it's such a treat. Uh, but here we are. Um, masks um, are hopefully a, a thing of the past. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that to begin with. Um, masks are fully, um, what's the word, optional. Uh, we're not going to force you not to wear them. We're not going to force you to wear them. Um, Piro, our resident doctor, says there are many good reasons to actually wear a mask, especially during winter with all the flus. So feel free to wear your mask if you want to. Uh, there is sanitizer around. You, you're welcome to use that, but we no longer have to enforce uh, the wearing of masks or the registration, you would have noticed, of people coming to our building. So we thank God for preserving us through these last uh, hectic years. Um, and we mourn, don't we, for those. We've lost several from our number uh, to COVID, so we mourn with those families. Uh, just to let you know, we're in holidays now, school holidays are upon us, and so most of our midweek meetings are in recess. Um, there are a couple that aren't, though. The young adults will continue on a Thursday night. Um, they don't know what school holidays um, are, and so Thursday night, the young adults will still be meeting for their Bible study and supper. And speaking of supper, we're wanting to ask if anyone would like to see catering as one of their ministries for the gospel. Uh, we, we, we provide a meal for the young adults on a Thursday and a meal for the youth on a Friday. Um, and it would be wonderful if we could uh, get more and more members of our congregation contributing to those meals um, as a ministry uh, to these young people that we are trying to reach for the gospel. Uh, we can reimburse you for ingredients, so don't let the cost uh, be a, uh, an obstacle to that. Uh, just to give you some feedback on our finances, uh, we do this uh, after uh, every month after we've uh, after the council have gone through the finances, and I'm afraid the picture is not looking good. It's bad news at the moment for um, our finances. A year to these are the year to date figures. We are about sixty thousand short for the year, so things are starting to get quite serious. Uh, we really have, in fact, for the last. Mm, Nine months, I suppose, really felt the, the bite of COVID, I think, uh, on the finances of our people and therefore the finances of the church. Uh, this month, in fact, is the first month since I've started here that we couldn't pay full salaries um, because there simply wasn't enough money in the bank. So please, can I ask you to uh, consider uh, your contribution to the gospel? Uh, we're not a charity. We don't do fundraising. Uh, the biblical model is that God's people give sacrificially and cheerfully. Uh, that's the principle, sacrificially and cheerfully uh, to the church that they are uh, benefiting from, to the ministry that is growing them and preserving them and uh, keeping them um, for Christ until they're in glory. Uh, and so if I can ask you just to consider uh, your giving towards the gospel, especially if you're online. We often forget that we've got quite a few people online um, it's, it's actually part of our worship uh, to give. Jesus says, when you give, give like this. When you pray, pray like this. Uh, it's assumed that Christians would give generously, sacrificially, cheerfully, and that we will pray. Uh, Jesus just assumes that that will happen. So uh, if I can commit that to you. Uh, just a last word, uh, just in case you didn't know, we belong to a denomination uh, called Church of England in South Africa, operating as REACH South Africa, uh, but there's no central funding. There's no safety net for the local church. It's up to each local church to raise the money they need for their buildings, their ministers, their uh, admin staff, or whatever. So just to leave that uh, with you. Now, our banking details are on the little uh, bulletin that you received and on the website, and uh, today we'll be taking a collection 
uh, actually, for the very first time in a long time. So if I can ask um, Mark and Greg uh, to take the bags around. We didn't do that because of COVID, but uh, we are going to start taking collections again um, if, if you support the gospel in the form of cash. Otherwise, of course, most people, I think, these days use means of EFT. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Greg. Won't you bow with me in prayer? But Father, we want to just pause and remember your many blessings to us, both spiritual, uh, but also material. And you've given us more than we need. And uh, we thank you for the privilege of being part of your amazing project of reaching the world for Christ and through our giving. And so please, will you use these gifts and offerings uh, to that end in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just to let you know, uh, today we're doing the next in our series. We're looking at Moses and uh, the Red Sea. Uh, and next week, uh, David and Goliath. So there we go. You've got a heads up. Why not think of someone you can invite uh, to next week's uh, sermon? Richard is going to be doing that one, uh, the story of David and Goliath. Well, we're going to stand and sing again. My Jesus, my Savior. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you, why don't you take a seat. Uh, Theo and uh, um, Theo Gregerson, as in Theo and Geraldine, will be leading us now in prayer. Now, that might not, not sound too strange, uh, except that they're not here. Uh, Theo and, Gregel, and Gregaldine, Geraldine um, have moved down to Waterfall. They're living with their children in Waterfall, but they still count themselves very much as part of this church. And so Theo has sent us a recording of his prayer, which I'm going to play as he leads us uh, in prayer through the recording. So won't you bow with me as Theo leads us now in prayer. Good morning, Christ Church Howick. Let us pray together. 
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as poor, weak, sinful children of yours and seek your mercy in our lives. Your word teaches us that your love reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mountain, mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. The Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. O God, we don't deserve your love and faithfulness. Our sin is ever before us. Yet, Lord, in Jesus Christ, you have righteousness through his death on the cross. And your word teaches us in the Psalms, the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is a stronghold in times of trouble. Lord, as we take refuge in you, you will deliver us from the wicked and save us. Thank you for your promises in your word about the second coming of our Lord Jesus, our Saviour. We long for that day when we will be taken into your very presence and join the heavenly beings in bringing praise and glory and honour to you before your throne. All my longings, says David, lie open before you, Lord. My sign is not hidden from you. Please be with us in our heartaches and troubles. Give us faith to trust and to follow you, no matter what befalls us. Lord, please give us a passion for people, to embrace them for Christ, to witness through our lives, and honour our call to reach those outside of the kingdom of God with the good news of the gospel. Please give us what Paul the Apostle calls, love that may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is so very much the work the many people who willingly serve you with various roles, the financial blessings through the years of ministry, the faithful preaching and teaching of your word, and Lord, above all, the people who have come to Christ and have been saved through this, your body of believers. Lord, our country is in a very poor state of godlessness. Many of those who should be leading this nation with integrity, have taken the path of self-gratification and selfishness. Yet, Lord, there is also those who claim you as Lord in their lives. So, precious God, we ask that you will give them strength to stand firm against godless decisions and practices. Heal our land, we pray, that the people of our country will be drawn to you and yours will be the glory and the honour. We pray for our missionaries of the month, Greg and Yvonne Cameron in Paraguay. Thank you for the message of salvation in Christ that has now been spread by our people. Thank you for the Bible translation project in that area. Thank you that the Camerons have been able to repair their truck in that remote area. Please be with their three children as they do homeschooling in Spanish. Thank you for the support the Camerons get from your children across the world. Please keep us here at Christchurch Howard, faithful in our prayers for them. As we come to worship you, our Lord and our God, please help us to learn from your word and search our hearts before you. Give your servant wisdom and freedom to preach your message to our hearts and to our minds. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. My well, friends, there's going to be a, a slight change. Uh, our prayer is followed by the readings, but I want to give a bit of an introduction this morning before we hear from uh, God's Word, just to give us a bit of background uh, to the story that we're going to read about today. We've been going through this series that I've entitled Sunday School Revisited, where we look at some of the famous stories uh, that we are so familiar with. Um, if we ever went to Sunday school as children, if we've grown up in the church, we, we know the story of Noah and the ark, uh, Abram and Isaac, uh, Jonah and the big fish. Uh, last week, we looked at Joseph and the coat. And then, of course, this week, we're going to be looking at Moses and the sea. 
Moses and the sea. We always say that Moses parted the sea, don't we? Is that true? Of course not. <laughs> okay, he is not God. God parted the sea. And so it's the story of Moses and the sea. Well, let me start by asking you this question. Does the 2nd of November 2019 ring any bells for you? It was a long time ago. There's so much has happened in the world since 2019. 2nd of November. It was the Rugby World Cup final, wasn't it? Between South Africa and England, played in Japan. England started out as favourites, of course, but Owen Farrell underestimated Cheslin Colby's sidestep, and, well, the rest is history, isn't it? South Africa came away with a famous 32-12 victory. As Sia Kulisi lifted the cup, the eyes of the rugby world were on him and his team. Everyone was cheering. There were fireworks. They did a lap of honor. Uh, they had the cup. It was a wonderful day. The team had covered themselves in glory. They covered themselves in glory. We say that, don't we? And I suppose rightly so in that circumstance. And actually, what we're going to hear in our reading is that God says three times that he is going to cover himself in glory. But what does that actually mean? What is glory? Well, glory is something splendid that's on display. It's what we saw when, against all odds, South Africa beat the most powerful team in the tournament in front of the watching world. They covered themselves with glory. They gained glory for themselves. And what we're going to see in our story today is something similar. God is going to go to battle against the most powerful king in the world, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who also viewed himself as the God of Egypt. You see, both God and Pharaoh claimed that the Israelites belonged to them. And so the scene is set for a showdown, and only one will come out covering themselves with glory. We join the story in Exodus chapter 14, right at the end of a very long conflict between God and Pharaoh, as God takes the decisive victory, and he gets the victory in the strangest way. You're going to have to go and read those preceding chapters to see how the battle between God and Pharaoh ebbs and flows until finally God emerges victorious. The question we want to think about today is, why did God fight the battle this way? And the answer comes up three times in this chapter, as I said. He says, in verse 4, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue my people, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Verse 17, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after my people, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. And verse 18, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. It's surprising, isn't it, to see that God's primary concern is not for the Israelites' freedom. If that had been the case, God could simply have wiped out the Egyptians back in chapter 1. Instead, God's concern is for his own glory. He wants the Egyptians and the whole world to know that he alone is the Lord, that he alone is awesome, that he alone can be trusted, that he alone is God, and there is no other. And so God's primary concern is for his glory. Now, we might feel a bit uncomfortable with that, God talking like that about himself, wanting to gain glory for himself. Isn't that a bit egotistical, you might say? Well, of course it would be if he alone wasn't awesome, if he alone can't be trusted, if he is not the only God. Then he certainly wouldn't deserve any glory, would he? But for God, it is right and entirely appropriate for him to display who he is and claim what is rightfully his. 
You know, when the Springboks walked around the rugby field holding up the Webb Ellis Trophy above their heads, no one was thinking, what a bunch of losers. Maybe the English were. Uh, you know, those guys have got such big egos. Who do they think they are? How dare they? No, the Springboks were the best in the world. They had earned the right to hold up the cup and receive the glory. And so too with God. He is the best in the world. No man or man-made God can compare with him. And the point of our passage is that not even Pharaoh can compare. Even though he is the wealthiest king in the world, the most, has the most powerful army in the world, even though he demanded to be worshipped by his people. You see, Pharaoh, sorry, the Egyptians worshipped many gods, but their highest god was this guy, Ra, or Re, depending on where you read. Ra was the creator god, and the Egyptians believed that their pharaohs were the incarnation of Ra. They were, the pharaohs were literally Ra in the flesh, the sons of Ra. At the coronation of a pharaoh, Pharaoh was given the title son of God, and they were given authority to rule over the earth, and they were to be glorified and worshipped. Every knee had to bow, and every tongue had to confess that Pharaoh was the son of Ra. So what we have in Exodus 1 to 14 is the battle of the gods. The God of the Hebrews takes on the, God, the son of Ra to show him up, to tear away the mask, to prove that he's a fraud and that he can't be trusted. Now, why does God do that? Why is he determined to humiliate Pharaoh, to gain glory for himself through Pharaoh, as he says? Sounds a bit petty, doesn't it? But friends, it's actually for our good. You see, God doesn't want us putting our trust and hope in things that cannot deliver. God doesn't want us to be deceived and disappointed by putting our eggs in the wrong basket. So let me ask the readers to come forward and bring us Exodus chapter 14. The reading is, is Exodus 14, 1 to 18. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Harioth, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go, and they have lost their services. So he has had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers all over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Harioth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. 
Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea onto dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Here ends the reading. Our reading continues in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, from verse 19. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. This is the word of the Lord. So God sets about getting his glory back. And he does that as a warrior fighting for his people. The Lord fights for his people to gain glory for himself. So let's just remember where we are. Last week, we left Joseph and his family in Egypt, 70 members of that family in all. In the 400 years between Genesis and Exodus, the family had become exceedingly numerous. We read in Exodus chapter 1, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So by the time the Israelites left Egypt, the 70 had become more than a million people. That's actually a perfectly reasonable population growth, about 2.6%, actually. I worked it out this week, uh, about the same as Afghanistan uh, population growth. So it sounds like extraordinary, but it's actually not. It's perfectly reasonable. Clearly, God was keeping his promises to Abraham to make Abraham's descendants into a great nation. But not everyone was thrilled. We read in chapter 1, verse 8, a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So the Israelites had become a threat to national security. So Pharaoh makes them into slaves, and the Israelites serve Pharaoh and the Egyptians for 400 years as slaves. At this point, God acts. And he sends Moses to Pharaoh with the familiar message, let my people go. And Pharaoh comes out with a classic line in chapter 5, verse 2, which sets about 
all the events that lead on from here. Chapter 5, verse 2, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh says, I do not know the Lord. In other words, I am the son of Ra. I do not acknowledge any other God. Who does this God think he is telling me what to do? Doesn't he know that I am the king of all the earth? He throws down the gauntlet, doesn't he? Pharaoh says, I don't know the Lord. And so God says, right, well, let's fix that. Let's fix that. And from then on, God says over and over, then they will know that I am the Lord. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Asks Pharaoh. Well, God's answer is 10 amazing displays of power in the 10 plagues. On the one hand, God shows Pharaoh that he is the son of nobody. And on the other hand, God shows Pharaoh exactly who he, the Lord, really is and why he should be obeyed. We don't have time to look at each plague, but each plague is basically a different battle that God wages in this war against Pharaoh as God fights for his people. In each plague, God is dismantling the Egyptian religious system by deposing one Egyptian idol after another. But each time, Pharaoh refuses to recognize the God of the Hebrews until the 10th plague, when the firstborn of every family dies and the war is won. Pharaoh couldn't even protect his own people. He is the son of nobody. God has fought for his people and prevailed against a man who considered the Israelites to be his personal possession. And finally, Pharaoh agrees to let the people go. The Israelites ask their neighbors for silver and gold, which they are more than happy to pay just to get rid of them. And after 400 years, the Israelites leave Egypt. They're finally free. God had done it. God had fought for his people, and they could leave Egypt and move on to their new home, Canaan, the promised land. Secondly, the Lord leads his people out of slavery again to gain glory for himself. So God meets his people in Egypt, and then he does something very strange. The Israelites knew very well where they were headed. They were going to go to Canaan, the promised land. God had told them that over and over again. Hundreds and hundreds of years of promises. I will give you Canaan. And they could have headed for Canaan directly. They could have followed the Mediterranean coast and gone straight to Canaan. But God doesn't take them on the direct route. We read in chapter 13, the previous chapter, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country next to the Mediterranean, although that was shorter. Instead, we read this. God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. God leads them in a southeasterly direction, straight for the Red Sea. You see, the direct route would mean that they would have to go through Philistine towns and past Philistine forts, and God knew that they weren't ready to take on trained soldiers yet. Remember, they had been slaves for the past 400 years. In chapter 13, 17, God says, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. These aren't soldiers, these Israelites. They're pyramid builders. I don't know, brick makers. But even this doesn't make sense when you think about it. If God could rescue his people from the mighty Egyptians, surely he could protect them from a few ragtag Philistine regiments. But remember, God's primary concern is to gain glory for himself, to show the world, and especially Egypt, that he alone is awesome. He alone can be trusted. He alone is God, and there is no other. And so he leads his people into a situation where the only option would be for them to trust him, and their only hope would be if he saved them. He puts them into the situation so that he can display his glory, both to the Egyptians and the Israelites. God is effectively saying, I'm going to make it even more difficult 
so that you can see my glory. I don't want anyone saying the Israelites just escaped from Egypt or the Israelites saved themselves from Egypt. No, God displays his glory by rescuing an utterly helpless people. And so by the end of chapter 13, we're told that God led his people by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of, cloud, of fire by night. We also heard earlier that the angel of the Lord escorted them. They came out of Goshen and they, they camped at Sukkoth and then moved on to Etham, traveling down the west coast of the Red Sea. And then God does something even more strange. If you've got a Bible, look at chapter 14, verse 2. God says to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Harioth between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. God basically makes them do a U-turn and sends them back the way they've come. And they camp about there where that dot is between Baal Zephon and the sea. Now, if all of this confuses you, don't feel bad. That was the whole point. <laughs> Did you notice that in chapter 14, verse 3, God says, Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. You see, he's setting a trap. The idea was to confuse the Egyptians. Just when it seemed like the Israelites might get away and escape down into the Sudan, they do an about turn and walk back into the clutches of Egypt again. God makes them set up camp in the worst possible situation imaginable from a military point of view. They've got the sea behind them. They've got the Sahara Desert to the south, and they've got Egypt to the north and the west. Actually, the Israelites are pretty much sitting ducks, and the Egyptians can't resist they think they've got the Israelites right where they want them, with their backs to the sea and nowhere to go. Well, the Egyptians think that they have the Israelites right where they want them, but actually, it's God who has the Egyptians right where he wants them. Remember, he's going to gain glory for himself through Pharaoh, this wannabe God, and his army, so that the world will know that he, the God of the Hebrews, is the Lord. Well, as we heard in the reading, Egypt does come after God's people. In fact, we're told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart to cause him to act. Now, you might be thinking, that's unfair. Isn't that unfair on Pharaoh? God made Pharaoh sin by attacking the Israelites. Well, before you accuse God, you need to have read the lead up in chapters 8 and 9. Three times in those chapters, we're told that Pharaoh and his officials hardened their own hearts. In other words, what is happening here in chapter 14 is that God is hardening already hard hearts. They had started the hardening process way back in chapters 8 and 9, and God is simply cementing their decision. He confirms the hardness of their hearts. He completes the hardening process that they had begun. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but I find that very frightening. Last week, we saw how the Ninevites softened their hearts towards God. And do you remember what Jonah, uh, chap how Jonah chapter 3 ends? When God saw what the Ninevites did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. You see, according to the Bible, this God that we're talking about here is a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. But if you harden your heart towards him, he will give you what you want. He will cement your decision to reject him, and then not even heaven can help you. You will have chosen calamity, and calamity will be yours to enjoy for the rest of your life. Friends, do not push your luck with this God. There is a line that you do not want to cross with this God. Well, Pharaoh crosses that line, and he mobilizes the full force of the Egyptian army 
against the Israelites. Did you notice that? 600 chariots, his special forces, plus all the other chariots he could muster in the whole of his kingdom. Pharaoh took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots and all the officers with all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Harioth opposite Baal Zephon. So Pharaoh sends out the army to take these people back into captivity, these people that he considered to be his own possession. And the Israelites, well, they panic. <laughs> they scream at God, and then they scream at Moses. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. Well, actually, if you go back and read, they said nothing of the sort. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Everyone seems to have quickly forgotten how God had just taken them out of Egypt with 10 amazing displays of power. They are so incredibly fickle, aren't they? They were so pleased to get out of Egypt, but now they've changed their tune. And they turn on Moses and they turn on God. You have brought us out of Egypt to die in the desert, they say. The Lord fights for his people to gain glory for himself. The Lord leads his people out of slavery to gain glory for himself. And lastly, the Lord delivers his people to gain glory for himself. So the people are panicking and Moses answers them, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians will see today that the Egyptians that you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The message is clear. This is God's battle to fight. You need only to be still. God will gain glory for himself, and he will rescue his people, deliver them, by destroying their enemies. Well, the Egyptians bear down on the trapped Israelites, and suddenly the angel of God moves between them and the Egyptian between them and the Egyptians. He goes from guarding the Israelites to protecting the Israelites. The pillar of cloud also comes between them, and the strong wind starts to blow. It blows all night, and when the Israelites wake up, they can't believe their eyes. The Lord has opened up a path for his people through the sea, and they walk out on dry land. I wonder what they might have thought as they walked through. Hopefully, I'm never going to doubt God again. <laughs> he is amazing. I can trust him to do anything. From now on, I'm going to do everything he says. Well, hopefully. The darkness lifts eventually, and the Egyptian army uh, see the path the Lord has made for the Israelites, and they go in after the Israelites. Now, I don't know about you, but don't you think their actions are massively presumptuous? They have defied this God their whole lives. They had exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles, and they served and created them instead of their creator, but now they assume that he's going to hold back the water for them to go through so that they can kill his people. I think that's a bit presumptuous. Well, we read in verse 24, during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of the chariot so that they had difficulty driving. That's putting it mildly. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. Finally, they understand what's going on. And their final words are profound. The Lord is fighting for his people. God's enemies had chosen calamity. Their destruction was their own doing. And so God gains glory for himself through Pharaoh and all his army. And despite his people's helplessness and fickleness, he shows his people and the world that he alone is awesome that he alone can be trusted, that he alone is God and there is no other.
Well, friends, let's wrap up. Just imagine you meet an Israelite who had just experienced what God had done for him. He's just been set free from Egypt. He's just walked through the sea on dry land. He has just been delivered by God. What would he say if you asked him, who are you, Israelite? He would say, let me start by telling you who I was. I was in slavery in a foreign land under the penalty of death, but I trusted the blood of the lamb that was painted on the doorposts, and the Lord led us out of slavery. We crossed over from certain death to life, and now we're on our way to the promised land. We're not there yet, but God is traveling with us to escort us and protect us and provide for us until we get to our new home. And if you asked him, what did you have to do to get rescued? He would say, I had to be still. The Lord did it all. It was his fight to fight. All he asked me to do was trust him. Now, friends, that's exactly what a Christian should say, isn't it? Because the story of the Israelites is the story of the Christian. If we are Christians, then we are God's people on our way to the new creation, on our way to the promised land. We've come out of a life of slavery to sin, where we were helpless and where we didn't love God and where we didn't do what he said. But God came to our rescue in the person of Jesus Christ, the real son of God. He fought for us by laying down his life for us on the cross, and he has set us free from sin and death. We've crossed over from certain death to life to be his people forever. The story of Moses and the sea is our story. It's the gospel story. It's the story of a loving God who comes to the rescue of a helpless people to gain glory for himself. We're on the way to the promised land, but we're not there yet. There will be many setbacks. There will be many dangers and obstacles and temptations. There will be times when our backs are to the wall and it seems like there's no escape. But remember, the Lord is with you to lead and guide, to provide and protect. He is your Father in heaven who will never leave you nor forsake you and who loves you with an everlasting love. He fights for his people. You can safely put your trust in him so that the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Let God fight for you. You can't save yourself. If you try and add to God's salvation, you're either trying to gain glory for yourself by taking glory away from him, or you don't believe that he's done enough for you by dying for you on the cross. So be still. Stop your rebellion. Stop trying to save yourself. Stop trusting in religion. Stop trusting in your own strength. And start trusting in the Lord who fights for you. He alone is awesome. He alone can be trusted. He alone is God. There is no other. He has opened a way for us to be saved. Have you crossed over yet? Well, won't you bow with me and pray? Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can see your glory in this story. We see that you are an awesome, powerful God. You rescued the Israelites in spectacular fashion. You fought for them and you saved them while they were still helpless and fickle. And Lord Jesus, you have fought for us on the cross. While we were still sinners, you died for us, taking what we deserve. Help us to trust you, whether we need to take the first step of crossing from death to life, or whether we've been on the road to the promised land for a very long time. You alone are awesome. You alone can be trusted. You alone are the Lord. There is no other. Amen. My friends, let's uh, try and warm up by standing and singing with all our hearts. You're the word of God, the Father, singing about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Let's stand and sing.
friends, thank you so much for joining us this morning, whether that was online, warm in bed, or here, freezing in the building. I hope that this passage was a great blessing and encouragement and challenge uh, to you. I want us to finish our time by reading these words uh, from Psalm 106, which reflect on uh, that opening of the sea and uh, God's rescue of his people. Listen to how the psalmist puts it. When our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake to make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe, from the hand of the enemy. He redeemed them. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them survived. Then they believed his promises and sang his prayers. Well, friends, we have been, a, we have been rescued, or have we not? We are the rescued people. Let us not forget our God. Let's not forget his many kindnesses. Let us not rebel. Let us live this week to bring honor and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, as always, um, if you can help us uh, just to move some of the chairs to the side to prepare for our evening service. Um, and there is hot tea and coffee, both at the hatch and at the back. And uh, if you can help us, like I said, uh, with catering, uh, that would be a wonderful ministry to get involved in. Thank you for joining us this morning.